Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Joining us now is our very own Victoria Jackson, author of Lavender Hair, 21 Devotions for Women with Breast Cancer. Victoria joins us on the last Monday of every month at the 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time Hour. Born in 1959, Victoria grew up in a Bible-believing, piano-playing, TV-free home in Miami. Her father coached gym, and she became a talented gymnast, even acquiring a college scholarship to Furman University. When Johnny Crawford, the rifleman, met her at a summer stock production, he encouraged her to produce act acting and brought her, bought her a one-way ticket to Hollywood. For two years, she held odd jobs in the showbiz capital as a cigarette girl, waitress, and even typist until Johnny Carson noticed her stand-up routine and put her on The Tonight Show 20 times. After that, she starred in many movies and TV shows, most notably six seasons on Saturday Night Live. Never wavering from her faith, she's here to join us as she does every month, every month, the last Monday of every month at 11 o'clock to talk about her devotions for women who have survived breast cancer. Victoria Jackson, it is great to see you, my friend. Thank you, Rabbi. Great to be here. Well, it's a wonderful time, and uh, uh, Happy New Year to you. It's the first time we've seen you in the new year. Uh, you are part of a family of now 17 featured guests uh, who have made, uh, really create the core backbone of the program as they appear every month bringing their specialty. And yours happens to be, uh, because you are a breast cancer survivor, and an author of a book about that journey and the devotions that helped carry you through. There you go, Lavender Hair. Uh, we thought that you would be a wonderful, uh, exciting, engaging, funny, uh, full of life guest who would bring perspective, not only having a uh, biblical point of view, but having a personal experience and having gone through and navigated uh, especially since you're now two years past, three. Th three years past, okay, three years past, and still getting good reports, yes? Yes. Good, good. So how have things been? Well, the funny thing is, I never think about cancer. So when you said what we were talking about today, I was like, did I have cancer? I don't even remember. I really, I can't hardly remember. And it's only been three years. Well, what do you attribute that to? Jesus. You think that it's the Lord who has kind of delivered you from it? Is it something that you believe that because you had so much faith going into it? Uh, you know, I've got a friend who's now navigating post-surgery, home right after surgery, uh, came home on Friday, uh, and now the emotions are kicking in, and um, there's a, kind of a cycle, kind of like the same cycle or similar cycle to grief. There is a cycle to the feeling, so I'd kind of like you to go back and remember, because this is really what we look to you for, is I can't really speak to breast cancer or what it's like to go through it, or how it affects a woman's sense of self-worth or self-image, what the emotions are, uh, first the fear, uh, how that process works. So maybe you can take us on a little journey uh, based on your experience, which of course everybody's experience is different, but where you found stages of rest, comfort, and where you turned to for comfort. Sometimes it was family, sometimes it was friends, but oftentimes it was the scriptures. And how does that process really work? And how did you go through it? Okay. Well, I was just watching a TV show the other day about a woman who just got diagnosed with breast cancer. So it did kind of relive the thing in my head. And I went, oh, I went through that. And I was kind of comparing her as a non-Christian going through it with how I went through it. Um, first, she was in denial. I wasn't, well... I don't know. I think there's so much to talk about. So let me start with this. The Bible gives us a perspective that we should have on our life. The world tells us 
we should be sexy, we should be rich, we should be successful, we should be beautiful, we should be whatever. The world tells us that. The Bible tells us that we should love the Lord thy God with all our heart and soul and mind, and love thy neighbor as thy son. And we, Christians try to do that, but we get so distracted with worldly things because we're living in our fleshly body and we're living in the world. And when everything's going good, I feel like I slip into that, you know, oh, my career's going good, or oh, I lost 10 pounds, don't I look better, and, or, you know, oh, I'm so popular, or whatever. But when you get cancer, it, it, it's, it's a great reminder of, it puts everything into perspective. All the little things fall to the bottom. The first thing is, oh, I have cancer, I'm going to die soon. Well. I knew I was going to die soon since I was six, because at six, I learned to read. I understood John 3.16. I was in a Baptist church that talked about hell and heaven and dying all the time. My dad was going to my grandparents' house to read the Bible to them every Sunday night, Romans, Hebrews, and John specifically, to try to win them to the Lord before they died, because they were older and getting closer to death. Um, so I was thinking about dying my whole life. But when you hear cancer, you're like, oh, I'm really going to die soon. And your perspectives, I, I was thinking, well, if this is the last year of my life, what should I do with it? You know, I thought I could go to Paris and drink wine and eat cheese all day. I could smoke a lot because I'm going to die anyway. I could, you know, and or I could become a missionary. And I could go to the most difficult place and spread the gospel or go on television or something and tell everybody that Jesus is or something. And then I thought, you know, I read about King Hezekiah and uh, my Bible study was studying Hezekiah and how Isaiah said to him, the Lord said, you're going to die soon, get your things in order. And he started crying. and. He looked at the wall, and then he said, God, I've always tried to serve you, and, and, and then God said, okay, I changed my mind. You have 15 more years. And I was thinking, I've named my dog Hezekiah. I was thinking, if I have 15 more years, if I survive this breast cancer, like many people do, now, medicine is great. Many people don't. I have friends right now dying of cancer. I have a friend who died last year of breast cancer. I have a lot of friends who survived breast cancer. So it's just a reminder that we're immortal. And, and uh, we, we, we remind ourselves when we read the Bible, but this is like a reminder. So I was thinking if I had 15 more years, if God gave me that blessing, it would go like that. It would go so fast. What am I going to do with it for the kingdom? What am I going to do for God? Because the Bible says, you know, whatever you do for the Lord, you, you get treasures in heaven. Whatever you, you do on earth, it just burns up. And that's rubble. So I thought, what can I do for the kingdom? And then I thought, what if I have one year? Now I've had three years. And every day when I, oops, I didn't paint this nail yet. Every year when I, every day time I realized I've survived cancer three years, I think, mean, what have I done for the Lord with that? The healthier I get, the more the more relaxed and lazy I get about the kingdom. It's human nature, you know? And then, um, and I think, and I think, well, I, I wrote a book and I put the gospel in it to try to reach people. I, I've, I've tried to be faithful to my family. I've I've, got, I've witnessed to people, I've, I've witnessed people, you know, I'm trying to, have I really, have I really used every second for the Lord? And, you know, if I get, if I, if my cancer comes back, like just happened to three of my friends who didn't have breast cancer for like the last three to five years, now it's back. If that happens, am I, I'll probably be invigorated to to tell the gospel more because it's so does that answer any of your questions 
They. But you mean emotionally as a yeah, woman? Em em emotionally, from a standpoint of if, if let's go back to diagnosis. All right, you get the diagnosis that you have breast cancer, um, found in a mammogram or because you found something that you felt you needed investigated. What were the initial responses to that? How did you um, find yourself responding to it? And then after surgery, because you had um, radical surgery, you had chemotherapy, you lost your hair, right? you had radiation, right? you went through all that process, and then um, at each phase of this, you came home and had to deal with home life. And at some point, you, th th there's pain, there's, you, you go from being mum zombified to mummified. Uh, you're all wrapped up, you're all bound up with bandages, you've got drains, you've got people who are have, you're dependent on people, which is probably something that you may or may not be comfortable with or that other people may or may not be comfortable with. Um, and so when we look at this, um, there's a, a whole lot of emotional uh, activity that goes along with this process. And it's a process from diagnosis to your three years of victory, um, that you're three years cancer free, uh, going back to those days when you came home from the hospital and um, you had the regimen of pain medications to deal with the surgical wounds, the surgical and the reconstruction and all of those things that went with it. You also had emotions, right? And I want to talk about what some of those emotions are and how did that impact your family? And what, as you look back on it, what advice would you have for both the cancer patient and to the family who's offering caregiving to understand what kind of emotions, what kind of thought process. You lay there in bed, they're in another room, you're in bed, you're trying to rest, you're sleeping, you wake up, um, do you have a bell you ring, uh, are, you, you want some attention but you feel like you're a burden, you know, what are some of the things that you struggle with? Great questions. Uh, I know everybody's different and everybody's cancer is different. My dog's biting me. <laughs> but uh, what, how to answer that? I, I'm a very emotional, hey, quiet. Let me put her outside. Okay. Outside, okay. First of all, everybody's different. But I'm a very emotional person anyway. So to me, it was kind of like just another day, I mean, the drugs worked great. The, my family is just my husband. My kids are grown. They, my daughter just wrote a book. <laughs> Speaking of which, did you know she wrote a book? I would love to see her book. Okay, I want you to interview her. She's 32. She, um, it's doing really well. It came out this month. It's called Afraid of All the Things, and she talks about my cancer in here. Wonderful. Have have her publisher or publicist send it to me. Get me a copy. We'll have her on. Well, see, she talks about her point of view of my cancer. And I saw it differently. She said she didn't know, does mommy want me to hang out with her? Does she? And she told me that I, when I was the weakest on chemo, I didn't want people around. I mean, it takes a lot of energy to smile at people and talk to them when you're I was so weak sometimes I couldn't change the TV channel the remote was too far away it was three inches away um so she says I didn't really want people hanging around my husband didn't sit by my bedside we just did everything normal um you know he would come in and say you need anything and I'd be like uh could I have some ice cream or something you know but First of all, you need a sense of humor. God gave us a sense of humor, and that helps so much. Laughter, and so here I am, I'm always emotional. I'm always having marital conflict. I'm always, you know, on an emotional roller coaster. That's the way I am. I am not like this. Um, I'm 
always jealous of my husband looking at women. So, of course, in the hospital, I think he's flirting with the doctor who's a woman or whatever. You know, nothing was that different. You know, I've always been insecure. Most women are always think they're not as pretty as the next door neighbor or the next girl at the gym next to them. So that was that was like not a new thing to say, am I going to be less pretty? I mean, we're all aging. I'm 59. I don't look like I did when I was 25 on TV. So I've been adjusting to that for a long time. Uh, so to me, it, life really wasn't that different. I've always been, I'm kind of, I was kind of happy I lost like three pounds. I mean, when I look at pictures now, I was like, kind of like that. And I was like, yes, uh, the healthier I get, uh, it seems to not be as skinny as when the kid, but I didn't lose 20 pounds from cancer, but everyone's different. You know, my friend has colon cancer right now and she lost a lot of weight. She actually looks great, you know, compared to, you know, television supermodel Twiggy thing we're supposed to be, you know, but, um, I, I don't think it affected my emotions that much. Uh, the pain, I had pain pills. But I took care of my own, um, what do you call those tubes that come out of you and you have to write down how much food came out. I did it myself because I didn't want my husband to see that icky stuff. But he, there was times my husband did wipe vomit off of the bathroom when I projectile vomited. It wasn't just because of cancer treatment. It was because I think I picked up a germ or something or, or was coughing too hard or something. You know, I only picked up like one germ in my year of treatment and uh, some kind of cold or something that, you know. And then I got dizzy one time, probably because of too much medicine in my body. I got kind of dizzy or it could have been because I did a handstand two weeks before, or it could have been because I was putting my head under the faucet to wash my hair and I wasn't allowed to get my bandages wet and my head was upside down too long with all the fat in it. But, you know, so, like, it wasn't that bad. I think I have a good attitude because of my Bible training. Bible verses were my comfort. Jesus was more real to me because I had nothing else. You know, at three in the morning in the dark, you're thinking, am I going to go to heaven to, to this year? You don't really care about your acting career or your weight or if you have breasts or not. And like I told you before, I've always had a difficult breast journey since I was raised as a gymnast and didn't start developing until I was 21. So I've always had this, you know, embarrassment, which I think is good for me. I, I think it gave me humility and um, having a thorn in the flesh, whatever it is, or thorns, plural in the flesh, I think it gives people humility. And sickness and death give people humility and aging too. I mean, my mom's 85 and she telling me, you know, how difficult it is. I'm like, hey, you didn't get your breast cut off. So, I mean, a sense of humor in our family. My husband made jokes. I made jokes. I was trying to look for jokes. I wore funny wigs to the doctor. Uh, so, yeah. When uh, you looked at yourself, did you feel um, was there depression? Was there um, uh, a loss of uh, identity or what your prior identity was? Things that you thought uh, that you would be um, less attractive to your husband or did, would you look in the mirror and feel like there was going to be a constant reminder? Um, you say it's been three years and you don't think about it, which means you're past the point of observation and connection to what you see with the eyes. Yeah, this is my new normal. And I sort of like my body and I think it's a wonderful miracle. And I don't I don't feel ugly. Uh, I 
you know, when I feel super healthy, like, didn't eat too much sugar the night before, uh, got nine hours of sleep, am at peace with God and things, I feel beautiful. It, it's not how I look in the mirror. I, I've never felt so healthy because I've been eating so much healthier and not drinking wine uh, like I used to, which I like wine a little too much. Um, and they say that causes breast cancer. People should know that. Uh, so I feel much healthier and younger and peppier. And that makes me feel pretty. You know, being healthy, I think health is the most beautiful thing. Um, so, um, what was the other part of the question? Well, I've seen a number of, of interviews you've had, a number of performances you've done lately. I've seen an increase in the number of roles you're getting. And so one of the things that I was encouraged by was that um, this was this did not become a stigma. This wasn't anything that followed you. It You know, you were persecuted for your faith. Um, my concern was, was that here you are now, um, the Hollywood is not so friendly to uh, people. I'm I'm almost uh, um, well. I'm seven years older than you, eight years older than you. Um, Hollywood is not so friendly to uh, our age. Then you have the added aspect of being a breast cancer survivor and being very vocal about it. Uh, but I was very excited to see you up here and to see some of your interviews and to see you are getting engagements and that that is also reaffirming for you and i think that that's one of the messages is that the family and the uh community that you belong to need to be affirming uh that that is what the bible instructs us to do let no unwholesome talk come from your mouth but only that which is for the betterment for the uplifting, for the encouragement of another. Um, did you have, um, and I want you to think about this before we go to break, because we're about to go to break. Um, did you have periods of time early on of any depression or any sadness or any loss of identity? Or because of the way Vicki Jackson is uniquely wired, uh, you're looking for the humor, you're looking for the punchline, you're looking for um, how can I turn um, tragedy into uh, joy, and that's really a part of what makes you you, but that is not unique to you, and everybody has that ability as to whether or not they apply that ability. We're talking to Victoria Jackson, author of the devotional Lavender Hair, a 21-day devotion for breast cancer survivors. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about the emotional journey that goes along with your identity through the breast cancer process and the recovery, and here three years later, how her view has changed. We'll be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.ignitinganation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting a Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. 
And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Victoria Jackson. And our featured guest who can be seen here every month on the last Monday of every month at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time, right, right here on the Igniting a Nation Broadcasting Network. Vicki, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. I'm really sorry about all the noise. The dog is barking. Well, this is li live reality Christian television. It's the way it's supposed to be. We spill things. Dogs bark uh, only on your segment. Uh, dogs bark. Uh, we have um, a number of, uh, of your five fingers. Only four of them have nail polish. Uh, you know, we notice all those things here on live reality Christian television, but that's what makes us real. That's what makes you real and why we have you on as a guest, because you bring a new dimension to the thought of breast cancer for women. And uh, part of your book is devotionals. Uh, devotionals where you found comfort for yourself. The first one you wrote the book for was for you uh, to get in touch with this whole experience. So tell us a little bit about Lavender Hair, uh, where, the, where the, the name came from. We've talked about this in the past, but our audience has grown. We're in our third year broadcast. We now reach uh, all areas of Pakistan and South Korea and Africa and many more nations that you are now being watched in. So help us understand the uh, concept of lavender hair and why you chose to take the comedic approach to breast cancer. Well, before you asked me, was I ever depressed? And I can't remember that I was because I hate to be sad. It hurts too much to be sad. I know people with depression, um, I always try to find, I have, I have been, always try to find something to hope for. Well, so 
when I was at my lowest point of fear and sadness, I asked God for a verse and he gave me Psalm 43, 5. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Why art thou, uh, something within me, uh, hope in God, oh, oh man, I forgot about her. Hope in God, but um, I will yet praise him, but, uh, my God and my Savior. There's different translations, but God just made that pop out of my little devotions I was reading in the lobby of the Vanderbilt Rest Point, and I thought, I will yet praise him again. Uh, might be in heaven, it might be here, but I will have something to be happy about again. And I wrote a little song about it. Why should I be discouraged? If God has a plan, he makes beauty from ashes. I will praise him yet again and again. I will praise him again. And that, that was like this private moment God gave me. Uh, he knows I love poetry and ukulele songs and so that was you know God is very personal I think he speaks to everyone in their own language and he knows my language and uh, that made me really happy um, hopeful you know the word hope is just a word but when you have something to look forward to that's hope I remember when I was having my second baby somehow they had induced labor, and I got emotionally very low. I was very excited about having a baby. She was healthy and everything, but for some reason, they drugs or whatever, I got very dark, and I felt like I had nothing to hope for. And I remember that moment. Uh, they just given me a spinal, like injected my spine with that thing that makes you numb so you don't feel the pain. and. It wasn't my, my natural personality, but I remember feeling hopeless. That must be how, even though I knew I was a Christian, it was like, it's not working. Bible verses aren't working. And then, uh, I don't know, the baby came out, I guess the medicine wore off or whatever was going on, and I was super happy again. I, I guess, I don't know. But, so yeah, I'm human. I, I have had fear and anxiety. One of my favorite Bible verses that helps me whenever I'm scared is Joshua 1.9, which I had to memorize in my Christian high school. It says, Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And that, I love that verse, you know. I'm like, I'm not Joshua, but... I'm like him because I follow God. And uh, that verse is our is uh, my daughter in her book, which you have to have her on. She's been on a big publicity thing this month, and she's so cute because she's never done this before. She's never been on TV. She was always the shy daughter behind the scenes, and she's uh, married to a pastor. And she's a mom of three, but she has always had anxiety. It started when I got divorced from her biological father when she was four years old. And I think divorce is very, very hard on children. It's like they're peaceful and secure, and all of a sudden the floor drops off from under them. And uh, what do you mean daddy's gone? What do you mean I don't live here anymore? And uh, that was the beginning, and she was always anxious about tornadoes and Oh, do I have appendicitis? And, and she just goes through the journey of her life and how all the things she was afraid of, God actually put her through them. Cancer scare, uh, she wasn't a tornado. She did have an ectopic pregnancy where her body exploded and she had uh, blood transfusion. I mean, and, you know, it's like that song she showed me. I don't know the name of the artist. Here, God, it goes the rain. Here I am, boom, boom, goes the thunder. Look at me, I'm all right. Bitter, powder goes the rain. Here I am, boom, boom, goes the thunder. Look at me, I'm all right. You know, I just, I love that song. Uh, anyway, our Christmas card this year, this is our family. And I love this picture because 
everybody was looking towards the camera. <laughs> it was a miracle. And um, my daughters, their husbands, my grandchildren. But on, I always put a Bible verse on my Christmas card. So I put Joshua 1.9 this year because um, that's, that's our verse this year. And God gives us lots of verses, you know. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.13, right? And 4.13. But, you know, um, when I had cancer, the Bible verses became real. They weren't just words. I was actually living them. You went through chemotherapy. Yes. And you took your chemotherapy not just by yourself. They, you had other people that were there in there with you. Uh, what was that like for you? And how did you use that as an opportunity to advance your testimony? Excuse me.
Your hair part of it, of course, you wanted to make a statement, so you had lost your hair, your beautiful blonde locks, and um, what you were always noticed for was your your hair was always an, a bow. Um, you always had a big bow. And well, I don't have, thank you for the compliment, I don't have beautiful blonde locks. That's why I had the bow thing, because, you see, my hair is... Talk about that journey. Reality is reality. This is reality. I was in a wig shop. But um, a woman's looks are a very big part, you know. Song of Solomon. Uh, in this segment and then we're done okay well i want to show you this painting i did because So how did you deal with that? Um,
I think it's funny too. You know, with God, all things are possible. And if you have a godly partner, then they travel this through you, through this journey with you and share. Um, I think for a man, it's very frustrating. Uh, he doesn't understand. He's very confused. He doesn't know how to respond. He doesn't know what to say. And he has to find uh, a biblical truth that says that this was the woman that God created for him, and that he must embrace her as he created her. And although he's not the, uh, uh, he allowed the cancer, he didn't give you the cancer, but he allowed the cancer to enter uh, the body. And uh, because of that, um, he knew that he could trust your husband, he could trust your family to walk this journey through it with you and to make you stronger. Uh, but for those women that are having these doubts, these women who are having um, emotions that they're, they're uncomfortable with or um, self-esteem issues that they're uncomfortable with, what words of encouragement? Because you've become comfortable. You become so comfortable with it that it really does not play a part. It's not the focal point. It's just an experience in a journey of a 59-year life. It's not the end-all and be-all. It's not the center. And if it can happen to you that it doesn't become the focal point, it certainly can happen to others. And that's really what we're looking for you for that inspiration as to how you're able to obtain that comfort level of really having it not be the focal point for your life. And when did that start to take place? Was it in the first month, was it six months in, was it a year in? When, when is, is this something that uh, those who are right now going through this, what do they have to look forward to? Uh, has uh, cerebral palsy, and he's been on crutches his whole life. Like, how does he, he, he never got married or had kids. Like, he's a man, and, and he's a wonderful person. Like, how does he deal with that, you know? He's not a believer. Um, people have a lot of things they have to deal with. Uh, people lose their lives in war. My friend's son drowned in their backyard swimming pool, and she has to live with that. I think that would be harder. And I think that suffering um, can bring us closer to God, or it can make us angry at God. And it's our choice. And it's our choice. And we have to get our priorities straight. Like, is my goal in life as a 59-year-old woman to be sexy? That's ridiculous. Um, if my husband doesn't love me, that's between him and God. I can't make him love me more. You know what's interesting? My marriage counselor, I told her I wanted to get the surgery where they cut my fat off and put it on my chest. Because there's several different things you can do. A lot of women are getting breast implants, reconstruction, whatever. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Depends what. You know. uh, but, but uh, I said to her, I'm thinking of doing that. I'm trying to gain weight, so I have a lot of fat on my stomach to put on the chest. And she's like, Why are you going to do that? I, I said, Well, I, you know, I want to be pretty for my husband. Then. I'm going to be pretty. I'm getting older, there's scars there, you know, it's not going to make everything perfect. And uh, she said, if you do that, she said, he will not love you one speck more. If you get breast implants or fat put on your chest and you have a scar on your stomach, he will not love you one speck more. And she's, and I thought, you know what, that's true. He not, if I lose 10 pounds, he's not going to love me more. If I dye my hair more, he's not going to love me more. If I 
And I thought, and then she told me that a woman she knows got a tummy tuck and died. She was a beautiful middle-aged woman, divorced, insecure that she had 10 extra pounds, got a tummy tuck and something went wrong and she slowly died in agony and pain at home. Uh, something was poison or infection or something. And she said, why did that woman have to die? You know, a man's not going to love her. She was a beautiful, healthy woman. So if you have a mate or a boyfriend that would love you less, that's, that's not really love, right? Okay. And I, my friend's husband left her. They got divorced during her chemo. Well, that's not a mare. That's not a good man to be with anyway. Good riddance. That's good that he left. If, if he doesn't love you in the bad times, then that's not love. Well, I think you make a very, very good point, and that addresses the issue of these emotions, is to hold on to the fact that if your husband loves you, he's going to love you whatever it is you go through, that this is a love that God has given him for you, and that that's a love he needs to hold on to. We've been talking with Victoria Jackson, author of Lavender Hair, 21 Devotions for Women with Breast Cancer. She appears here on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network on the last Monday of every month at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. Get her book, follow her online. You can see her in lots of different places and book her. She's funny, she's great, and she's a Bible, strong Bible believer. And you have a CD. Rabbi, this is a DVD I just made. If anyone wants to buy it, it's for sale on my website, victoriajackson.com. It's called The Only Show in Town. And it's a documentary. I think my makeup is really bad today. Sorry, audience. It's a documentary, and they see I used to be young. It's a documentary about what happened to me after Saturday Night Live. And it shows me doing stand-up, how I got on TV, how I got off, my family, what really counts in life, the only show in town. And if you want to buy it for $10 on the website. VictoriaJackson.com. Victoria, always, Vicki, glad to see you. Good uh, with, uh, happy New Year to you and your family, and have your daughter get me a copy of that book. Well. All right. Shalom, my friend. Shalom. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.